Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as the speedrunning equivalent of a horse girl, and this is an any percent speedrun of Fallout 4 VR. Typical any percent rules apply to this run where glitches are allowed, but things like loading pre-made saves and using console commands are not. Also right away, I'd like to warn you that the fastest way to move around in the VR version of this game is super choppy and might be hard to watch for some of you. You'll see what the movement is like practically immediately in the run, like you can't miss it, so hang around to see if it's something you think you can deal with. If it isn't, then here's the deal. You can stop watching, but you have to leave a comment telling me what your favorite movie is. That's our deal together, okay? I'm a big movie guy, so I might respond to a few of the comments here and there talking about movies, but only with people who have to leave because they can't deal with the movement. If you can watch the movement just fine, but still leave a comment about your favorite movie, how dare you betray my trust like that? If you do betray my trust, then you're legally obligated to follow me on Twitter. Anyways, let's get to today's sponsor. Yay, I'm a kid, it's my birthday, this is my birthday party, yay! What up, I'm Gavin Chainsaw Hands, I heard that there was a birthday party, so I invited myself to tell you that it's also Frag Pro Shooter's birthday and that they're sponsoring this video. Frag Pro Shooter is designed specifically for mobile devices and is celebrating its second birthday. Frag is so freaking easy to learn and play, even if you have chainsaws for hands like me. You build your own deck and strategy to destroy the enemy bunkers as quickly as possible. There are over 90 characters to collect, all with their own rules and powers. Like Zap Girl, who zaps her enemies with her zap stuff. I don't have much time to play games because I talk to so many chicks, which is why I play the Street Frag mode. The map is smaller and the game is quicker, making for a quick turnaround between rounds. I took the liberty of making a tomato anus club for you to join if that's what gets your socks off. You can get free rewards to celebrate Frag's birthday by using the link in the description, and it even works if you already have Frag installed. You'll get a gold chest, 500 coins, and 50 diamonds, which is a $6 value. Be sure to check it out by using the link in the description. Can I play? Can I play? Yes, anyone can play. So right away before I confirm my character, you can see that in the VR version of this game, you can kind of just walk through walls. I'll explain the mechanics of this a bit more in depth in about two and a half minutes, but it's pretty intuitive. I pretty much just poke my head or arm through the wall and move to the other side of it. Once I confirm my character, I'm going to immediately clip out of the house and begin spamming the move button to quickly move through Sanctuary. This is the movement I was referring to that may be hard for some of you to watch. If that's the case, then go ahead and tell me your favorite movie below in the comments. If not, then keep your eyes up here, buckaroo. I'm making my way to Vault 111 where I'll then clip into the ground beneath the elevator by getting down on the ground in real life and sticking my head into the concrete platform. Once I bring myself to the very last ledge that I can stand on, I stand as far back in my VR play area while staying on the ledge and then walk forward in real life to fall off the ledge and enter the loading zone for the vault. Inside the vault, the elevator isn't moving because of how a sequence broke this, but I can progress through the vault still by clipping out of the elevator and cancelling the fall damage by spamming to move just before I hit the ground. I then do the normal stuff in the vault like grabbing the jumpsuit and then waiting for the doctor to run down the hallway before entering the cryopod for the cutscene. While I do that, I should say that if you haven't watched my any percent speedrun of actual Fallout 4, I recommend you do that first. It's by no means required reading for this video, but I will be referencing that route here and there throughout this video to discuss the differences in the route and why I do things a bit differently in the VR run. Additionally, I should address that there are two timers in the bottom right corner. The larger one is in-game time while the smaller one is real time. I've explained the difference between these two ad nauseum in videos in the past, but if you're new here and don't know the difference, then leave a comment asking and I'm sure one of the regulars will fill you in. Or you can just watch the first 5 minutes of that regular Fallout 4 any percent speedrun video I mentioned a moment ago because I go over things like how in-game time works, why I play in French, and what difficulty the run is played on all in the intro of that video. Let's quickly address the first major difference in the VR route compared to the normal one before I talk about how we clip through walls in VR. In the normal route, we go through the entire sequence inside the house and enter the vault as Bethesda intended. We could technically skip all that like we just did in this run, but the issue is we don't have a way to consistently clip into the ground like I did by just sticking my head into the concrete. If we had a way of consistently clipping into the ground, then we could clip out of the house, which we do know how to do in the normal version, and then clip into the vault and presumably use the same clipping method as we did to clip through the ground to clip through the vault elevator and skip a lot of the intro like in this run. So now let's talk about how clipping works in the VR run as I casually exit my cryopod to witness a second degree murder and kidnapping. As you can see on screen, there's a teal colored box and grid. 
In Steam VR, you define your play area and the room you're gaming in. This is the area you're safe to roam around in while you have the headset on, and when you get close to any of the boundaries, the box and grid will appear as a visual warning that you're close to a wall in your room. This is so that you don't whack anything in your room like those Wii wrist strap screens always warned you about. Anyways, in Fallout 4 VR, you're free to walk through walls and objects as long as your play area box extends past said wall or object. Additionally, you can stick your hands through walls and click the movement button to just move to the other side of the wall, but there has to be either solid ground or an object for you to move on top of on the other side of the wall. It's pretty wonky, but it's a really fun speedrun trick and mechanic once you get used to it. This brings us to the big discussion and question you may have if you're familiar with the normal any% percent run. What speedrun tricks and glitches in the normal speedrun work in VR? For as big of a question as that might seem, the answer is super simple. Pretty much none of them. Punch warping and cover sliding don't work because the in-game mechanics that those break and take advantage of are either completely reworked for VR or just absent. And the biggest glitch of them all, which is load warping, doesn't work because we can't quick load in VR. The main speedrun trick we have in VR is walking through walls, which we can't do in the normal game, and we're going to absolutely abuse the fact we can walk through walls in this speedrun. Just you wait and see. Once I finally gain control after the cryo cutscene, I'm going to immediately run through the vault, utilizing the fact that we can walk through walls to skip going through several hallways. In the normal run, we only pick up the security baton and then use traffic cones to VLC clip through walls and exit the vault quickly, but in this run we go through the vault a little more. This is because we need to manually pick up the pit boy and to be able to do that, we need to exterminate the rad roaches that have made the vault their home over the past couple hundred years. If you don't clear out all of the rad roaches, then the game typically restricts you from picking up the pit boy. This is why I went on my way to open a few doors a moment ago instead of clipping through them, as well as right here, so I can take out the bulk of the rad roaches at once and have any that I passed earlier be able to follow me into the next room. The clearing out of these rad roaches brings me to what I found to be one of the more difficult things to do in this speedrun. Combat. At times it seemed like I was aiming perfectly down the sights at enemies, but my shots were still missing. It's very well that it could have just been a weird VR perspective thing that made it hard to aim, but Fallout 4 has a reputation of not necessarily registering surefire hits, like this shot right here from a run I did last year was a miss. So the jury's still out on whether it's just me or the game, but my money's on me just being dookie at aiming. So now that I have the pit boy rather than open the vault door, I positioned myself in real life on the far end long ways of my play area so I have the most runway to clip through this wall right here and enter the elevator room in the vault. Positioning myself in real life so I have the most room to walk forward to clip through walls is pretty common in this run, like how I did it right here to enter the elevator. I'd say it's probably the biggest thing to get used to and good at when speedrunning this game. So once I got into the elevator room, I clipped into the elevator shaft and moved into the trigger that allows me to exit, but also edit my character, which I elect to do so I can decide my special points since I skipped that earlier when I clipped out of the house. For this run, I max out Endurance and Agility because it optimizes our AP and allows me to move fastest across the map. When I get out into the wasteland, I'm going to immediately start running towards our first couple objectives. As I said before, the VR version of this game doesn't have punch warping, which if you're familiar with the normal run of this game, you'd know that we typically use that right now to teleport to the center of the map. To move around quickly in VR, I just spam the trigger on the left controller to move as fast as possible. In the settings for the game, I have direct movement set to off, which is what makes it where I point and click where I want to move to and the character teleports. This style of movement is just straight up faster than having direct movement on, which you hold forward and your character runs forward. Even if having direct movement on was faster though, I don't think I'd play with it on, because surprisingly, it's much less nauseating to have the headset on and teleport everywhere than to be smoothly gliding everywhere. There is a moment near the very end of the run though where we turn direct movement on, but you'll have to stick around for that. Also, as I just mentioned, I spam the left trigger to move quickly, and your speed does largely depend on how fast you can spam the trigger. I found a lot of success with speed and consistency to use my right hand to spam the trigger rather than my left finger, which you can see me doing right now on the bottom left, and you'll see me do this during other long running segments in the speed run as well. So what am I actually doing right now in the run? Well, upon leaving the vault, I immediately ran to Discover Bull Sanctuary and the Museum of Freedom so I can fast travel back to them later, and then made a beeline to Slocum Joe's in Lexington. In the basement of Slocum Joe's, I point and click to move my character on top of some cabinets, which puts me on top of them and technically standing with most of my body out of bounds. I then utilize walking across my play area in my actual room to move the character off of what we're standing on to fall into the area called the switchboard where I cancelled my fall damage by spamming the move as I landed. 
I then picked up Carrington's prototype, which is a quest item for the railroad loyalty quest, and then clip out of the room I'm in to grab a hazmat suit for radiation later on. I'll then clip quickly back into the prototype room to be away from enemies and pull up the pip boy to equip the hazmat suit and also drop Carrington's prototype which automatically gives me the quest Tradecraft. This segment is pulled straight from the normal any percent run so I won't go too in depth about this trick but I also won't go too in depth because we're not too sure why it works how it does. In short though, it lets me ally and build the teleporter with the railroad without doing any actual quests. To exit the basement quickly, rather than ride the elevator, I clip out a bounce here and fall directly underneath the upper level where we entered, causing me to upwarp to that floor, skipping the elevator ride and saving time. This is a piece of tech in Fallout 4 called Center on Cell, or COC for short, which is a very common term in my Fallout videos. If we fall out of bounds rather than fall forever, we either get upwarp to whatever solid ground is directly above us, or if there isn't any, to a predetermined location that is unique to every playable area you can enter. While not as common as in the normal any percent run, COC will rear its unfortunately named acronym head a few times throughout this run, so be sure to ingrain that term in that skull of yours. So we're now outside moving to our next objective, which is to discover green tech genetics, and it's a good time to talk about my physical prowess and how it plays to my advantage in this VR run, and just how elite of an athlete I am. I stand at a lean, mean 6'3", which means I have long arms. VR adjusts your height so that your normal eye level is at the intended eye level in game. This means that you wouldn't have any physical advantage doing this if you were super tall or super short because your height in game is always the same regardless of your height in real life. If you have long special arms like me though, you're able to still reach up really high for getting your controller above obstacles in game and being able to teleport to the other side of them. The downside of being a gifted freak athlete such as myself though is that sometimes your natural instinct will be to jump to try to get your controller even higher and you have to watch out for your ceiling. Speaking from experience with that one, because I may or may not have hit my hand and controller on the ceiling during one of my Twitch streams. And speaking of freak athlete, here you get to see my impeccable swimming form as I enter the sewer underwater. Swimming in VR isn't too difficult to do, like it's easy to get the movement down, but if your character is touching any solid objects like a wall or floor, then it's hard to get your character to move more than an inch or two per stroke because they continually get caught on the wall or whatever. In this sewer is where I do the big sequence break of the game. I was able to just swim through the collision of the pipe that we spawned in, and then I swam out of bounds up to here where I hit a quest trigger to give myself the last quest in the main story of the game, Nuclear Option. This is one of the parts in the run where playing in VR makes something unnecessarily more difficult, and in my opinion is one of the hardest parts of the run. Normally to exit this sewer, after getting the quest trigger, I just fall out of bounds and COC to the entrance where I can then exit this area. In VR though, it's really hard to get out of bounds while you're swimming, so I instead just go to the top of water and clip back and bounce, which isn't too hard. The hard part, believe it or not, is just swimming through this damn pipe to get to the exit. Like seriously, look how much I struggle here. There is a lot of free time loss right here from me being unable to swim. Anyways, regardless of what YouTube comments have tried to tell me over the past 4 years with speedruns of this game, we can't just go and finish the game right away now that we have the final quest. In order to capitalize on having the final quest, we have to enter the institute, and to do that we have to build the teleporter. We can't use any of the other entrances due to intricacies with quest stages. To build the teleporter, I have to become allies with one of the factions, which I've already partially done by doing that thing in the basement of Slocum Joe's where I dropped Carrington's prototype. Right now, I'm on my way to finish off that process and join the railroad by running through downtown Boston to the Old North Church, discovering the mass fusion building along the way as a fast travel point for later on. As I open the door to the Old North Church, take note of how I look around to see where I'm at in my play area and then move to stand in the far right corner of it. This is to preemptively position myself so that when I spawn in, my play area will extend greatly to the left of the spawn point. This way, I can easily then walk through a wall immediately on my left and clip out of bounds to COC in the basement at the entrance to the Railroad HQ. Here I speak with these weirdos who stand around 24-7 waiting for someone to enter and are okay with letting someone who just apparated from the nether join their little club. The first conversation here is going through the dialogue that you go through when you first meet the railroad, and once we're done with that dialogue, then we'll speak with Deacon twice on the right side of the room. The first of the Deacon dialogues will be the dialogue as if we had just picked up Carrington's prototype with him and are on that mission still, and the second one will be us turning in the Tradecraft quest and joining the railroad. 
Here I move to the entrance and back to Deacon as he starts his long first line in the second dialogue sequence, which skips his first line and gets Desdemona talking and begins our onboarding process with the group. As the dialogue wraps up, I'll walk forward and wrap up talking with Des as I stand near the sliding door that will open up, allowing me to enter the Railroad HQ proper. In Fallout 4, when you join the railroad and become a member, then you gain the ability to fast travel to and from the actual HQ even though it's an interior area. This makes it one of five interior areas in the game you can fast travel to and from, with the others being the Institute, Vault 88, the house you can buy in Diamond City called Home Plate, and the Mechanist's Lair in the Automatron DLC. As I enter the HQ, I fast travel to the Museum of Freedom, which we discovered the location of during that long first run upon exiting Vault 111. Inside the Museum of Freedom is our one big combat segment of the run where you get to see how bad my aim really is, so go ahead, get it all out in the comments, I'm bad at aiming, I know. This raid right here though was a bit annoying this run because normally they spawn in the first room I entered which is why I looked around upon entering the first room but for some reason they were in the second room so there was a bit of time loss there. The reason why we came back to the Museum of Freedom, even though we're going to side with the railroad, is that in order to complete the big sequence break with how we got the nuclear option quest in the sewer, we need to get an item that spawns on Sturges. This item only spawns once we have the nuclear option quest, which is why we didn't come in here when we first left the vault. We have to pickpocket the item off of Sturges, and to pickpocket Sturges we have to both clear out the raiders in the museum, which is why I went through the process of doing that rather than just clipping into the room, and we also have to not be in dialogue with Preston and Sturges. This is why upon entering the room with them and starting up the dialogue, I immediately turned around and ran away to exit the dialogue quickly in VR. In the normal run, we usually shoot Sturges four times to aggro the Minutemen, which skips the dialogue, but we've all seen how my aim is in VR, so I decided to play it the safe route with just running out. Also, it's only a 49% chance to steal the quest item off of Sturges, so normally I would level up the pickpocket perk once before trying to pickpocket him to play it safe, but I forgot to do that in this run and just ended up getting a bit lucky. So after I exited the museum, I fast traveled to Mass Fusion, which is the location I discovered while running to meet the railroad. Here when I load in, I immediately run to the entrance of Good Neighbor. In the normal run, we enter Good Neighbor a lot earlier. In fact, we do it right after doing the sewer thing and before we meet the railroad, and we typically enter through a loading zone in an alley rather than the front door. The reason for the quick pit stop in Good Neighbor is that it both gives us the fast travel location for later, and there's also a fat man here that we can steal by peeking our head and hand through the wall and then dipping like nothing ever happened. Also, if you didn't notice, earlier when I grabbed Carrington's prototype, there was also a mini nuke right next to it that I grabbed as well that we'll be using as ammo later on. Once I exit Good Neighbor, then I'm just going to be making a beeline to Diamond City where I'm going to simply clip through the back wall of it to walk into the loading zone to enter. In the meantime, let's talk about how the load times in this compare to the normal Fallout 4 run. So, the final RTA time for this run is much shorter than the RTA time for the full normal run. Also, if you're unaware, RTA stands for real-time attack and is the full time your run takes without removing loads from our time. There's two reasons why this run is faster in RTA. The first is that for some reason, the VR version of this game just has much faster loading screens. I don't know what they did to make them faster, but they overall just are a lot faster in this version of the game. The second reason why is that the normal any percent run utilizes a trick called armor stacking that increases our movement speed for the rest of the run, but performing the trick causes a lot of loading screens. So while the normal run becomes much faster if you don't count the loads because we're moving a lot faster thanks to armor stacking, there are a ton of extra loads that drag down the time when you do count the loading screens. For this reason, the VR version of this game is officially the fastest way to beat Fallout 4 using typical any percent rules if you go by RTA timing. So back to the run, the reason why I swung by Diamond City was twofold. The first reason was to get the fast travel point for later, but the main reason was to enter Nick Valentine's detective agency. Normally, Nick starts the game stuck in Vault 114, and we have to rescue him before we go confront Kellogg, the dude who offed our wife. You aren't supposed to be able to get to Kellogg without saving and having Nick with you, but in the speedrun, we have a way of getting to Kellogg without meeting Nick. In the old days of Fallout 4 speedruns, we would go and talk to Kellogg, then go and save Nick. It was discovered in early 2018 though that if you enter and exit Nick's agency before talking to Kellogg, you hit a trigger that moves Nick. Then, sequence breaking the game by confronting Kellogg without having met Nick, moves Nick to his agency and we won't ever have to go rescue him. I apologize if that explanation caused any confusion. I said the names Nick and Kellogg a lot. 
In short, just know that by visiting Nick's house without him being there, and then talking to Kellogg without Nick being there as well, makes Nick angry, and he then will just rescue himself and meet us at his house. That brings us to what we're doing now. We're on our way to go talk to Kellogg in Fort Hagen. Normally after you rescue Nick, you meet up with Dogmeat as well, who then leads you to Fort Hagen after sniffing one of Kellogg's Cubans. The doors to Fort Hagen are locked by default until you meet up with both Nick and Dogmeat and progress the quest far enough, and we haven't done either of those things so far on the run, so the quest for sure isn't set up for us to be able to enter Fort Hagen. The two doors to enter Fort Hagen are going to be locked and inaccessible, however, there's a third entrance that we can use. There's an elevator we're supposed to ride to exit Fort Hagen once we're done there, and the elevator is behind a locked door, but this locked door isn't like the other two. It isn't one that we would interact with and then load into Fort Hagen proper, it's just a barrier in the way between us and the elevator, meaning I can just clip through said door like I do here. This lets me reach the elevator, which I then ride down into the building, granting me access to Fort Hagen without having met Nick or Dogmeat. In the elevator, I'll pull up my Pip-Boy to favor and equip the Fat Man that I stole from a good neighbor, but I ate some popcorn before doing my run, so I accidentally dropped the Fat Man at first instead of favoriting it. Let me just say though that using the trackpad on the controllers to menu and favorite things is super finicky and harder than it looks. Once I've sorted out my Butterfinger issues, I rotate my character so my play area extends to the left side of the elevator, giving me a bigger runway to clip through the hallway when I exit. In the lower hallway, I stand briefly by a closed door, hitting a trigger that spawns Kellogg. I then make my way to talk to the dude himself. When I entered the room with Kellogg in this run, I got trapped into dialogue with him when I didn't want to. This made me panic and accidentally take out my fat man, aim at the ceiling, and fire my mini nuke, abruptly ending our conversation. While the conversation was short-lived, it did allow me to loot the quest item called the Cybernetic Brain Augmenter off his body, which is required to progress the run. After that, I looted a nearby military-grade circuit board and accessed a terminal to progress a quest stage and made my way back to my old friend, the elevator. Here I just ride the elevator up, and at the top, I'm going to clip through that one door again to exit and then run far enough away from turrets on the roof to be able to fast travel to Diamond City Market. It's at this point in the video where we're going to start hitting stretches that aren't overly complicated, so I'm going to be fast forwarding the run here and there, but as always, the original, unedited run is available in the description. At Diamond City, I ran back to Nick's place where he'll now be located in talking to Piper, and this part is pretty straightforward. I just have to talk to them to get through the dialogue to progress the main quest to the point where we're ready to go through the memory sequence. Yes, the memory sequence is still a thing in Fallout 4 speedruns in 2021, and unfortunately there are zero skips inside the actual memories unlike in the normal any% percent run where we're able to just punch warp to one of the final rooms. There is one piece of time save in the VR run though that isn't in the normal run. Well, at least it isn't in the normal run anymore. Once I'm done talking with Nick and Amari in the basement here, and once Amari finishes hooking up Kellogg's brain augmenter into Nick, I'll have two additional quick lines of dialogue with her. Once those pieces of dialogue are done, then we'll be prompted by the quest to sit in the memory lounger. If we sit in the lounger without doing anything fancy, then Amari has an approximate 30 second dialogue that she goes through before we're ported into the memories. What I do in this run though, is once I'm ready to sit in the lounger, I shoot Amari to aggro her and get her health to the point where she's one shot from being downed. I then wait for Nick to also go into combat and start shooting at her, at which point I pop one more shot into her to down her. I then put away my weapon to have Amari and all other nearby NPCs forgive me, and I then sit down in the lounger. This causes the screen to immediately fade to white, saving about 22 to 27 seconds depending on how fast you're able to perform the shooting part. This is a skip that I found in early 2017 that for some reason doesn't work in the normal any% percent run anymore, presumably for some reason involving the whole armor stacking load warp shenanigans, and we haven't been able to figure out exactly why it doesn't work yet. For this reason, it hasn't been a part of the normal any% percent run in almost two years now. The memory sequence itself is very standard in the VR run, with us just having to run through all of the memories to the last one, and then just waiting for the cutscene to play out. The walking part of this segment is a bit tricky due to constantly having to turn your head and the movement in VR just being a tad touchy, but overall it isn't too bad. I'm going to fast forward through this part of the run too, and I apologize for having relied on fast forward so heavily in the past 3 minutes of the video. It's just that this short stretch of the run is very vanilla, and not much is actually going on in terms of speed tech. I know that the fast forwarding stretches of gameplay aren't fun to watch, but after this one here, then there won't be many more for the rest of the video, I promise. 
It's just that I think I'm not alone in the fact that I don't want us to sit here for two and a half minutes just watching slow walking and then standing there for a cutscene. I'd like to take advantage of this slow moment in the run though to remind you, as always, that no feeling is final. I beat this drum in every video during slow parts of runs, but really, it's worth saying every time. Life can be hard as hell sometimes. Our lives have ups and downs, and usually it's the downs that make themselves more known. But remember that there will be ups in the future. The down moments are not the baseline for how you'll feel for the rest of your life. It's only momentary. There are and will be happy days ahead. If those happy days seem too far away, take it one day at a time. Focus on today and the fact that even if things seem awful, when you go to bed tonight, you'll still wake up tomorrow. Just remembering that the things in my head weren't the end of the world and that I'd wake up tomorrow helped me get through some tough times in the past. And that's the whole idea behind the no feeling is final quote that I spout every video. So let's get back to the run. When I exit the memories, I need to exit the building to be able to fast travel to Diamond City. The fastest way in VR to get from the basement of the memory den to the front door is to move the character on top of one of the nearby cabinets. The game lets us stand on top of the cabinets, which makes the rest of us poke through the ground of the floor above us, so I can then just run to the exit. When I arrive in Diamond City, I'm going to turn around and exit and then begin the long final running sequence of this speedrun. We have to make it to the far bottom left corner of the map to meet Virgil. The story reasons for this are we're trying to find our kidnapped son and we learn that he was kidnapped by the Institute and from the memory sequence we learn that we have to teleport there. Virgil used to work for the Institute so we're going to talk with him about a way to teleport there so we can get our son back. So in the normal any% percent speedrun, we perform this run across the glowing sea a lot earlier. In fact, we do it after the first time we arrive in Diamond City and before we ever go to Fort Hagen to meet Kellogg. Virgil isn't spawned in the normal any% percent speedrun when we run across the glowing sea because he only spawns after the memory sequence, but we do it anyways for a few reasons. The main two are to set up a save to load warp into Virgil's cave later on, which again, load warps don't exist in the VR version of this game, and the second main reason is a bit more complicated. In short, rather than run to Fort Hagen like we did in this run, we punch warp to it in the normal speedrun, which again, punch warps aren't doable in VR. The Fort Hagen punch warp is really weird with how we take advantage of the way the map loads, and it needs to be activated in a specific area in the glowing sea. So in order to skip the run to Fort Hagen, we just move the run through the glowing sea to earlier in the run. Also, I just realized, I know I said that my previous Fallout 4 speedrun video isn't required reading for this video, but by this point, I've referenced things like punch warping and load warping a ton, so I'll just say now that if you're unfamiliar with the terms, punch warping is a glitch that lets us teleport by using vats, and load warping is a glitch that lets us load old saves while retaining progress. Hopefully that clears some things up. I'd also like to take this moment to talk about a couple obstacles that exist in the VR speedrun that don't cross over into the normal one. One of said obstacles is, well, obstacles. It's so freaking easy to just get caught on objects in VR and not be able to move past them. And people are no exception. Pretty much every NPC in the VR version of the game could be an offensive lineman on the Packers. They're so obnoxious, it's absurd. Because of how hard it is to get by people and really just everything in this run, when I'm running through densely packed areas, you'll see I often raise up my controller to at least shoulder level. This is just so my magic point and move wand has a line of sight above most objects and I'm able to just jump to the other side of them. You can see that here especially as I climb up these rocks to get to the decrepit factory to loot a biometric scanner that spawns there. This biometric scanner as well as the military grade circuit board that we grabbed after our chit chat with Kellogg are components that are needed to build the teleporter to enter the institute, which we're going to be doing pretty soon. Also, one thing I was worried about in the VR run was waking up and aggroing the death claw that spawns in the little bowl down here in front of the entrance to the cave, but in none of my attempts did it even wake up, which is a bit weird considering it wakes up in every standard run. So now that we finally arrived at the cave, after getting caught on some hanging cans, we get to meet Virgil, and you know how they always say people seem taller or shorter in person? Well, let me tell you, Virgil is way taller in person than he appears on the screen. It felt like I had to look straight up to even make eye contact with him. This dude's gotta be like 7 foot 4 at least, but he never looks that tall when I'm doing normal runs or even now watching this video back while recording. So when we talk to Virgil here, he's pretty much just saying that in order to teleport to the Institute, we need a Courser chip, which we can find in the noggin of a Courser. 
The courser spawns in Green Tech Genetics, which is the location we purposefully discovered near the start of the run when we first ran to the downtown area right before we got the final quest from the sewer. In Green Tech in the normal run, we trigger a punch warp to teleport to the top floor where we ride an elevator up to the courser. We obviously can't do that in VR, so instead, this split has me first lob my character up to the second floor balcony and then head to a side hallway. In this side hallway, I'm blocked by some rubble, but in VR, I'm able to just move the character into and on top of the rubble to get out of bounds. There isn't really any trick to it, just point and move and you get out of bounds. On top of these hallways, the places I move to are a bit more precise to stay on top of objects with collision so I don't fall into the hallways, and then to get back in bounds, I just stuck my hand through the floor above me and click to move. I'll now stay in bounds for the remainder of this area and ride an elevator up to meet the courser. After the elevator ride, I'll have to run up a bunch of stairs though, which just left me wondering why the architect didn't just plan to have a longer elevator shaft. The fact that with this segment we're able to do such cool out of bounds like we just did, but then at the same time have to run up a bunch of stairs perfectly highlights the strengths and weaknesses of speedrunning this game in VR. On one hand, your ability to move and walk with your character is so free. You can walk through practically anything, and in most areas in the game you can go out of bounds to skip things. The downside though is that walking through things is really the only main speed tech. While certainly helpful and allows us to break the game and beat it quickly, it's just not as well-rounded as the tech in the normal run. In the normal run, we can clip through walls with items, teleport up and down and across the map, and carry our progress into old saves. There are just a lot more problem-solving tools at our disposal, which is ultimately why the normal any% percent run is faster without loading times. So at the top of Green Tech, we spoke with the courser briefly to get him to hand over his courser chip, and then we exited the building by unlocking a door with a terminal and just fast traveled back to the railroad HQ. Normally what happens when you join the railroad is Desdemona gives you a tour and then gives a big speech introducing you to everyone, and all of that is really slow. We typically skip that in the VR run by entering and exiting the HQ, then fast traveling to Sanctuary and back. In this run though, when I returned from Sanctuary, Desdemona was still giving her speech, losing me a bit of time and requiring me to fast travel across the map and back again. I think the cause of this is when I originally joined the railroad and entered the HQ for the first time, I fast traveled away to the Museum of Freedom before Des had a chance to enter and begin her tour and speech. Overall, it isn't the end of the world, it was a 15 second time loss, which isn't a catastrophic mistake, but it's still a sizable number that can be shaved off the run easily with more attempts. Once all these fast travel shenanigans end and we're able to actually talk with Desdemona, we'll run up to her and talk to her about building the teleporter to enter the institute, but also loot some objects around the HQ so we have enough components to actually build the teleporter. Our dialogue with Des leads into a dialogue with her and Tinker Tom, who is easily the cause of the most potential time loss throughout the entire run. Tom has a set sleep schedule, and depending on how the run has gone so far, not only is there a chance that he'll be asleep when we need to talk to him during the final stretches of the run, but there's also a chance at one point that he'll be standing in this one unfortunate spot that causes his dialogue to go by super slowly, but we'll cover that more when we get there. Right now, Desdemona is just finishing her introduction of Tinker Tom while we're running around looting things for their components, and once we get to a point in the dialogue with Des and Tom, we can shoot each of them quickly to skip a line or two of theirs. We then speak with Desdemona to hand over the courser chip because turns out it's encoded, but that's what Tinker Tom is for. He's going to decode it for us, and usually the sequence is a lot of waiting for Tom to get through a bunch of his lines, but we can skip a ton of them by running to the HQ exit and leaving and coming back. This won't fully skip the lines though, so once we re-enter, we're going to have to run up to Tom and shoot him a couple of times to skip the last few lines he has going on. The line we're looking for is the one that starts with the words, solve for N. That's the last line in his dialogue, and once we see that line pop up, we're free to fast travel away to Virgil's lab, and the quest will automatically update as if we had received the decoded courser chip from Tom without actually having to sit through the last line of dialogue. When we arrive at Virgil's lab, we're going to mash through all of our dialogue with him, and this is actually one of the few instances in the entire run where instead of selecting the bottom option, we instead select all of the right options that are more of a negative statement. Choosing all the right options here has been a part of the Fallout 4 speedrun since I want to say around mid-2017 and saves about one second compared to picking all the bottom options. With Virgil, we make a deal that he gives us the plans for the teleporter that we need to build, and in turn, when we're in the Institute, we'll find and bring him a serum that will turn him back human. 
Unfortunately for Virgil, he min-maxed strength and intelligence at the cost of charisma, speech, and barter, so we're going to stiff him on our end of the deal. Oh wait, there's no speech or barter stats in Fallout 4. With the teleporter plans in hand, we make our way back to the HQ where we'll talk with Desdemona and then Tinker Tom about actually building the teleporter. A moment ago I mentioned how Tinker Tom is usually the cause of big time loss in the run, and this run is a shining example of the biggest way you can lose time. When we go to talk to Tom, he's standing in a specific spot that's known for causing his dialogue to lock up where we're not able to mash through it and skip his lines. It's a huge time loss. Best case scenario, you can fast travel away to somewhere like Green Tech and Back and he'll have moved, but he doesn't always move because sometimes he'll just get so caught up in his speech. In this run, I let him go through a few of his lines before I attempted to do the fast travel, which did work with relocating him and letting me skip his lines, but still, overall, this is a pretty sizable time loss. In this run, it ended up losing me about 30 seconds, so while it could have been worse, like this is known to lose people over a minute in the runs, it certainly isn't ideal. It's 100% what I would consider to be the biggest time loss in this run and the biggest potential time save in future runs. The worst part about the potential for this happening though is that the spot he can stand in where this happens is far and away the most common location he'll be in. And when he's standing there, it seems like over half the time this dialogue lockup happens. Luckily, due to how the in-game clock works out in the normal any percent run nowadays, if you're on good pace then it's super unlikely for Tom to end up in that location that causes it, but I guess that the VR run just isn't there yet with the current route. After talking to Tom, I pulled up my Pip-Boy to drop my military grade circuit board because right now I'm fast traveling to Sanctuary to build the teleporter base which requires 5 circuitry. Believe it or not, the circuit board can be scrapped for circuitry, and if we don't drop it then the game will automatically scrap it over other circuitry items we've picked up. This is bad because we need the circuit board intact as a component to build one of the later pieces of the teleporter. This is why I dropped the circuit board, so it couldn't be scrapped from my inventory, and then when I return to the HQ here, I'll pick it back up so it can be used to finish building the teleporter. That is, once I'm able to actually find it on the ground here. I then speak with Tom to progress the quest where I build the teleporter, unlocking the final teleporter components for me to build in the workshop menu when I return to Sanctuary. So in the past, in my Twitch streams and in YouTube comments, I've been asked what my favorite part of the Fallout 4 Any% percent run is. For some reason, my favorite part of the run by far has always been the building of the teleporter. Not the split as a whole because of how annoying the NPCs can get with locking up dialogue or wandering off, but the actual act of building the teleporter. It's just something where doing it quickly and smoothly feels so good. I'm sure you can imagine my frustration going from being able to menu quickly and easily and moving around quickly to place objects rapidly to doing this in VR. Building the teleporter is so dissatisfying in VR due to how difficult menuing is with the trackpad on the controller and also how we can't smoothly move while placing objects and just have to turn my body and head instead. Anyways, once the teleporter is built, I go to talk with Desdemona and there's a brief moment that encapsulates what I mentioned earlier when I said that the NPCs can be annoying with locking up dialogue because while trying to talk to her, both Tom tried to talk to me and also the wrong dialogue started with Des for half a second before continuing our intended conversation. After this conversation, what's supposed to happen is I step onto the teleporter platform and then stand there for like 90 seconds as I listen to Tom boot up the teleporter and eventually teleport me into the institute. Instead what I do is once Tom begins a certain dialogue line as a part of the long spiel he goes through, I pull up my Pip-Boy and fast travel away to Concord. This completely skips Tom's dialogue and upon loading in at Concord, the teleport animation plays immediately and we get teleported to the institute, saving a monumental amount of time. So, the Institute is the part of the run that I would say most varies from the standard any percent run. It starts off the same with me loading up that holotape quest item I pickpocketed off of Sturges into the terminal, which absolutely breaks the game and has Preston teleport in. This is the big sequence break in the game, and I wish there were time to explain it, but there really isn't. In short, this lets us complete the game with both the Minutemen and the Railroad, despite never rescuing the Minutemen and building the teleporter with the Railroad. This is caused by how we got the nuclear option quest in the sewer. Preston gives us a fusion pulse charge to place on the institute's reactor to destroy it which will end the game and therefore the run. I have to get to the reactor first though so right here I clipped through a wall and fell to the institute's main concourse where I cancelled my fall damage by spamming the move button as I landed. I then walked through a big closed door to access the door to enter the institute advanced systems area. Here I run through a little intermediary area before entering the reactor area. So as I run to the reactor to place the pulse charge and then back, real quick I want to go over what this looks like in the normal run. 
Normally, after placing the pulse charge, I make a quick save and load warp out of the Institute to Diamond City. After that, it's a series of fast traveling to the Railroad HQ a couple times in a row to get through some dialogue, and then returning to the Institute to finish off the game. We don't have load warping in this version of the game though, so we have to exit the Institute the old fashioned way. Once I eventually clip out a bounce here, I'll COC to the start of the reactor area where I'm going to move my character on top of a shelving unit. This will put me on top of the room. I'll then carefully move myself to be standing on the absolute corner of the room. There, I'll interact with an invisible door that's labeled as taking me to the financial district. This will load me in on top of Mass Fusion in downtown Boston. This is how speedrunners used to exit the Institute way back when the game first released and before load warping was found. It's also how console runners exit the Institute to this day, since there's no load warping in the console version of this game either. At the top of Mass Fusion, I immediately walk off the ledge of the building and experience what is easily the most nauseating part of the run. After cancelling my fall damage by moving right before I hit the ground, I now make my way back to Old North Church to get to the Railroad HQ. I can't just fast travel there because for some reason with how I broke the game with the nuclear option quest, the game thinks we're still inside of the institute even though we're clearly not. And we can't fast travel because you can typically only fast travel to and from the institute after completing the quest institutionalized which I haven't done. So after arming the institute reactor we have to go through a dialogue with Desdemona followed by one with Tinker Tom but we can't knock them both out at once for reasons you'll see in a second. When I enter the HQ here, you can hear faintly in the background a popping noise. This noise was Desdemona teleporting into the Railroad HQ. Because of our quest stages, the game has to have her get through the line she says when we plant the pulse charge, which is what she says here, but I skip them by shooting her a couple times. Once I get through her lines, I get teleported back to the Institute because they just haven't had enough of me yet or something, I don't know. This whole getting teleported back to the Institute business is really inopportune because as I said before, we need to talk to both Desdemona and Tinker Tom. In order to talk to Tinker Tom, we have to go back to the Railroad HQ and there's only one way to do that since we can't just fast travel there for reasons I said earlier. We have to go back to the reactor area to access that invisible out of bounds door again and then run across the map again. It's a real hoot having to repeat my actions like this, especially when I have to repeat a long running segment. You all saw me do this exact run a moment ago, so let me just fast forward us through this real quick. Give me one second. This won't take long, I promise. Just hang on. One more second. And here we go. So now that we're back in the HQ, we can talk to Tom to progress the nuclear option quest again. When I talk to him, I immediately turn my body to prepare to leave because we only need to get through the first couple lines and then we can immediately run away. The quest still updates as if we had gone through all of his dialogue, it's just that a handful of conversations in the game only need to get to a certain line for the quest to update and it just so happens that this one progresses really early in the conversation. So to progress the game now, we just need to get back to the institute, which is much easier said than done. I'm exiting the HQ through the back entrance here so I don't have to run through the maze that is the basement of the Old North Church and once I'm outside, I'm going to immediately make a beeline to Mass Fusion again. Also, again, I can't just fast travel to Mass Fusion because the game thinks we're inside of the Institute and therefore we're unable to fast travel. So you know how we've exited the Institute twice now with that invisible door above Mass Fusion? Well, that's how we're going to get back into the Institute. We're not Spider-Man though, so I can't just climb up the side of Mass Fusion to get to the top. We're kinda like Kitty Pride though, so instead I'm going to clip into the side of Mass Fusion to get to the top. So I'm now through the wall of Mass Fusion and here I get low to the ground and stick my hand in the ground to move myself onto this steel beam where I then walk off to fall under the map and COC directly above me to the top of Mass Fusion. Up here, I'm going to climb to the very top, and once I make it all the way up, you'll notice a floating component of the HUD that indicates a quest marker. This quest marker is telling me to go through the floating invisible door that I mentioned a moment ago, so I use the quest marker as my visual indicator for where the door is. The door is too far away for me to just run through my play area to run off the ledge and reach it, and we also can't jump forward through air with the teleport movement setting, so I changed my movement settings here to turn direct movement on. This is the moment I was referring to 35 minutes and 10 seconds ago when I talked about the direct movement setting. Also, it took me two tries to access the door, but you try opening a floating invisible door while falling through the air. It ain't easy. 
When I load back into the institute, rather than loading into the reactor level, the door loads me in right next to the teleporter pad where we typically teleport in at. This is perfect, because in order to finish the game, we have to step onto the teleporter pad to get brought back to Mass Fusion. This time, when we actually get teleported there though, it updates the quest stages to the final ones, which activates the detonation device on the roof. That means when I load in, I'll be able to interact with the detonator to blow up the institute, ending the run. The run officially ends when the HUD disappears after the explosion plays out and the screen fades to black. As the run ends, I'd like to quickly say thank you a million times over to those of you who support the channel on Patreon. We're almost at 150 patrons, which is a number I never thought possible, and when we reach that goal, I'll be putting up a poll with several game options that patrons will get to vote on to decide what run will be covered in the next speedrun explained. For as little as $1 a month, you can participate in that poll too and also get access to videos early and periodic updates on videos as they're being made. It's by no means necessary though, and you should only consider doing it if you have a few extra bucks sitting around each month that you'd be okay with kicking my way to help keep the lights on. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to the speedrunner Bubbles Del Fuego who was the first person to do VR runs of this game. The route in this video is largely the same route that Bubbles put together. Bubbles mostly focuses on Arkham City speedruns these days, so if that sounds cool to you, then google the name Bubbles Del Fuego and check out their stuff. As always, be sure to check out my Discord. The people there are super inviting and always happy to see new faces and just chat about whatever. They're a real wholesome group, not sure who they got that from. Link is in the description. That's all for this video though. This was an any% percent speedrun of Fallout 4 VR, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day. This wasn't the world I wanted, but it was the one I found myself in. The Commonwealth. My home. Ripped apart and put back together. I thought, I hoped, I could find my family, cheat time, make us whole again. 